All right, everyone, I think we can go ahead and get started. So um, this is Brittany, I'm Tyler's wife. I just wanna quickly, before Tyler gets started, go through some meeting etiquette. I think we have about just over 30 people on the call. I think, um, I think the best way to do this is if anyone has questions as we go through, if you could just keep yourselves on mute so we don't have a lot of background noise. There's a lot of uh, content here in a short amount of time. So to keep everything efficient, if you could just pop any questions into the chat. And then as we go through, we can have check-ins and, and kind of revisit some of the questions that have come from the group. Um, so leave yourself on mute, please, just again, so that everyone can hear Tyler's presentation. Um, slides will not be shared, but we are recording this and we will be sharing the recording. So thank you so much everyone for joining. I think Tyler has been working on this presentation for a long time. Um, I don't know how long Tyler's been keeping bees over 10 years, I believe. So, um, he has a lot of experience, but he's been working on this presentation for well over a year now. So he's super excited to share this all with you guys. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate you guys taking time out of your Sunday to learn more about uh, beekeeping. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Tyler. Hey, I can't see myself. We can see you, Tyler. Go ahead. Okay. Well, if I want to show something in the screen, is that? No, we can see your screen and we can see your face. Okay. So go. I think you can go ahead and get started. All right. So is it on table of contents for you? Yes. Okay. So uh, hi, everyone. It's good to, uh, I guess I can't see you, but uh, it's good to be here with you. Um, yeah, I've been working on this since October of 2022. So it's pretty long. It's 157 slides, it looks like. Um, we'll start going through like some of the biology and the way bees communicate, uh, how they control their temperature, and then we'll get into like what supplies you need to do beekeeping, um, including tools and then also hive components. Uh, then we'll talk about how to install bees, whether you're installing a package of bees or a nucleus hive, and we'll talk about what those are. Um, we will um, talk about how to use the smoker and what it's used for. And we'll go into inspection techniques, um, talking about how to physically move through a hive and, uh, and then we'll talk about findings, things you might see inside the hive, like eggs, larvae, kept brood, nectar, and all those things. Um, then we'll talk about how to handle a queen bee, uh, what to do to prevent swarming, and how to catch swarms, um, how to prevent robbing, uh, which is where honeybees from other colonies uh, start robbing your colony of, of honey. Uh, we'll talk about the different pests and diseases like uh, varroa mites, small hive beetle, wax moth, and then um, there's some infectious diseases also. Um, and then we'll talk about season specific things like how to overwinter your hive. And then last but not least, we will talk about harvesting, harvesting honey, uh, rendering beeswax, um, how to collect propolis if you wanna do that. And uh, then we'll finish off with like some safety considerations and um, what resources I use for um, education, for educating myself. Um, she's pretty much already introduced me. This is me, I'm Tyler, and uh, that's my chicken, uh, Olive, I think. <laughs> um, so reasons to keep bees, personal fulfillment, uh, you know, just a hobby, just something. Hey, hey, Tyler, just sorry to interrupt. Can you just give a brief introduction of like where you live, what oh, type yeah, of sure. environment you live in? Because I think yeah, that's so definitely... We are in uh, Boston, so um, it's a, in the suburbs of Boston. So it's actually, we have a lot of neighbors. And um, so you can actually keep bees if you have neighbors. Um, you just have to pay close attention to them and, and make sure that um, you maintain a gentle hive and also uh, make sure that your neighbors aren't allergic or anything like that have issues. Um, but yeah, I've been doing this for... 10 years this will be my 10th year uh this this spring and um started out with one hive the most i've had is seven um so it's i don't know it's like I, i'm in there every single week so 
it's actually fairly time consuming even with just what you do? what you do? Uh, what you do? Uh, so let's see i'm gonna skip back ahead uh, a little background on beekeeping some beekeeping history uh, before people kept beehives they would uh there were hun honey hunters is what they called them um who would just go out and find wild bees nests and they would steal the honey and that would leave the bees without any resources um, and they would usually um, just die. So then people started to make hives like the skep hive you see on the top right of the screen and then the clay beehive that you see on the bottom. They started making these hives where they could keep them in their reach and just make it easier to, to maintain bees. But the problem with these is that it didn't uh, get rid of the problem of having to destroy the beehive to get the honey. So uh, people worked on different hives. There's hives that had removable combs that you could take out, but they weren't frames. They were just a, a top bar. And we'll talk about top bar hives, but you would just remove the bar and the comb would be hanging down. But the problem with those is that the, the comb would often stick to the side of the inside of the hive and they would stick them to each other. So it wasn't super reliable for, um, not destroying the, the hive. And, um, Let's see. Yeah, honeybees were imported to North America from Europe in the 17th century. Got that on there. Where's the next, the next slide here? Oh, there we go. Okay, so, um, and then there was Lorenzo Langstroth, who's the father of American beekeeping, who uh, sort of built off the progress of those folks that built removable combs. And he actually made frames that had uh, what he called bee space. He found out through experimentation that if uh, if throughout the hive, if every space was greater than one fourth inch, but less than three eighths inch, that the bees wouldn't fill that space with uh, with comb or propolis, making it all sticky and hard to remove things. So he actually figured out how to keep bees in a way that was more practical for modern day beekeepers. And his design has changed slightly, but the main principles of it have remained the same. Um, and five years after he invented the Langstroth hive, um, Johannes Mehring, I think is how you pronounce it, he invented foundation, which is, um, actually I have some right here. It's just some a, a film of beeswax that you put inside the frame and it gives the bees something to build their comb off of and it helps keep it straight and it also helps make it more sturdy. Um, let's see. We will be almost exclusively talking about Langstroth hives because that's all I've kept. But I do want you to know that there are some other types of hives that you might be interested in, and even that I'm interested in. Uh, one is called a top bar hive, which is a horizontal hive <laughs> here in the photos. Um, these are similar to the the predecessors to the Langstroth, where it has just a top bar that you pull up, but there's no frame. And one of the benefits of of this style is because it's horizontal and there's no multiple stories you can when you open the hive it's that's everything everything's there you don't have to you know remove boxes or anything like that um but the downsides are that there's still some issues with the bees uh hooking the comb to the sides of the hive so you have to take a pipe tool and and actually dig down there and separate the wax from the hive to pull it out so it's kind of a mess um, and that's actually what's kept me from, from doing it. Um, and then there's the war a hive. If I can go to the next slide, maybe. Yeah. War a hive. Um, this is the same as the top bar hive, except instead of being horizontal, it's vertical. So it still has just the top bars. Um, but instead of it's, it's similar to the Langstroth in a way, cause you, you stack boxes on top of each other. Um, a lot of these also have these viewing windows, which makes me want to get one because it's kind of neat. But there are also Langstroth hives that have viewing windows. So let's see. All right, now going into a little bit of biology. So there's three different castes of bees in a hive. There's the worker bee, which is the female. The drone bee, which is the male, 
And the queen bee, which is female, and she's the only one that has a fully developed reproductive system. So she's the one that lays all the eggs. And um, they're all, all of these different casts, they're an egg for three days, as you can see on the chart. They're an egg for three days, and then they become a, a larva. And then uh, they pupate, and they get capped on day nine. The, the cell, their cell is covered up with beeswax. And then they um, finish developing and then they emerge. And then the, the worker bees emerge after 21 days, the drones after 24 days. And the queen, believe it or not, is only 16 days. And we'll talk about why hers is shorter, even though she's the biggest bee in the hive. Let's see. So uh, honeybee senses, I won't spend too long on this. I've been warned that it's pretty boring. Um, there's... Uh, Honeybees have two sets of eyes. They have ocelli, which are these three eyes on the top of their head that are in the shape of a triangle. And those are the lights they use to detect intensity and direction of the sun. So it helps them to know where they are in space. And then the compound eyes, the ones you see on the side, those are the ones that help them see patterns and colors, which helps them find flowers and, and different things to forage on. Uh, they have taste receptors in their antennae. Uh, they have uh, odor receptors. They have they hear through a, an, an organ on their leg called the Johnston's organ, which picks up vibrations. Um, they also have internal and external touch sensors. And then those little dots you see down the side of their abdomen, uh, those are called spiracles, and that's actually how they breathe. That's how they they take in oxygen. some other anatomy. So when a bee goes to visit a flower, it uh, uses its proboscis, which is this straw-like tongue that it has. Um, it's actually made up of multiple parts and it unfolds and it turns into a straw-like uh, contraption. And they use that to suck nectar up out of the flower. And while they're doing that, pollen gets stuck in these hairs that you see on their thorax. And uh, it starts to collect there. And then when they leave the flower, they use these little combs on their feet, on their legs, to uh, scrape the, the pollen off, and then they pack it into these little things on their hind legs. I don't know if you can see them. It says pollen basket. It's, uh, it's literally just a little basket to put their pollen in, and they pack it in there. They mix it with some saliva to help uh, make it compact, and they pack it right into the backs of their legs, and they they carry that back to the hive along with the nectar, which they store in a, uh, a separate stomach. It's not their digestive stomach, but they have a honey stomach that they store it in while they fly. And so they fly those things back to the hive. And when they do go to fly, they actually attach, they have two sets of wings, their fore wings and their hind wings. And they the hind wings actually have hooks on them called hamuli, and they hook them together so they have bigger wings for flying and then they disconnect them when they land and they want to walk around. Um, as for beeswax, they have eight wax glands along their abdomen, the underside of their abdomen. And they, they use those glands to produce its liquid wax at first and then it quickly solidifies into little flakes. And you can actually find some really cool pictures of this online of, of honeybees with wax flakes on their stomach. So they, they take those off when they're in the hive building comb. They'll take them off and they'll chew on them and make them more malleable. And then they'll use them to make their, their comb. Now into more um, cast specific biology. As I mentioned, the queen emerges after 16 days. And the reason she's so much bigger, even though her development time is so much shorter, is because she's fed royal jelly which is this uh, protein-rich substance that the worker bees secrete from their, their heads. They have a, a gland on their head that they secrete this from, and they feed the royal jelly to the queen uh, her entire development. And so she gets this protein-rich diet that the worker bees, they get something similar, but only for the first three days of their development. And so they never actually develop uh, fully functional ovaries. They do have ovaries, but they can only uh, lay lay uh, uh, haploid eggs, which are eggs that can only turn into male bees. They can only turn into drones. So only the female, only the queen bee can lay female eggs. 
and make more worker bees and grow the population. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so the queen has a stinger that does not have a barb. All worker bees have stingers that have barbs so that they sting you. The stinger actually sticks into your skin and it, when they pull away from you, they actually die because it pulls out their insides by the stinger. But the queen bee has a, a barbless stinger. So she could actually sting repeatedly if she wanted to, but she's highly unlikely to sting. I think that's probably a, a uh, protective measure because, you know, if, if something stings you, you want to kill it usually instinctively. Um, so they have a, a barbless stinger. They lay some sources will say 1500 eggs per day. Some say 2000, but it's a, it's a lot of eggs uh, per day when they're at the height of their productivity you know, their first year or two. Um, and yeah, they could live, they could live for uh, several years. I've heard of people having a queen for like five years, but they really stop uh, being so productive after a couple of years. So usually they're replaced either by the bees themselves or by the beekeeper. Um, let's see, worker bees. I think I've actually mentioned pretty much all of this in the queen Oh yeah, so they they are responsible. The worker bees are responsible for virtually everything. They uh they care for the queen. They care for the brood that are being raised. They feed they feed all the brood. They are the ones that go out and forage for nectar and pollen. Uh, they're the ones that guard the hive. So they they do virtually everything for for the hive. And uh, yeah, their average lifespan during the summer when they're foraging they actually work themselves to death after about six weeks but over winter a worker bee can live for several months because they have to to survive the winter and they're not out flying constantly they're staying more or less inside um, let's see. so uh worker bees as i mentioned they do pretty much everything but everything they do is age-based so the general rule is that you know they live six weeks the first three weeks of their life they're doing inside jobs and the last few weeks of their life they're doing they're doing foraging outside and somewhere in the middle there before you know between doing the inside jobs and going out to forage they're the guard bees they're right at the entrance so they kind of work their way from the inside to the outside and there's different jobs the you'll see bees doing there's housekeeper bees that clean up the cells there's nurse bees, and even that's further further uh, broken down into younger nurse bees and older nurse bees, depending on uh, their age, determines how which larvae they're feeding, the older larvae or the, the young brood. Um, you'll see construction bees, you know, age 12 to 17 days old. They're the ones that are making the comb and, and moving food around in the hive. And then right there around that three week mark, that's where they move to the the guard duties, and then they become foragers. So drones are larger than than worker bees. You can actually see the the drone I've pictured here, and and next to it there's some worker bees. You can see it's quite a lot bigger, uh, but they have no stinger. They cannot defend the hive. They're not uh, able to sting at all. They don't do any foraging. Their only thing that they do is they they go out and mate with queens, which gets them a lot of uh, flack, but they, but they uh, are actually pretty important because if you, if you don't have a, if you don't maintain a good genetics in your apiary, like if you have really aggressive bees, then those drones are going to go out and mate with queens. And then that aggression is going to get passed on to another apiary. So it's actually very important to have good drones. Um, and yes, they are kicked out. You'll see them systematically removed from the hive in the fall because they're just a strain on resources. They, uh, they just eat and they're not really performing anything over the winter, any, any functions. So they, uh, they just get the boot. They get dragged out of the hive and dropped onto the ground and prevented from coming back in. Um, let's see. Oh, just a couple little uh, bits here. So it's best to think of the the colony, the honeybee colony, as a a super organism, and not any one bee is particularly important. I'm, the queen's pretty important, but 
no single worker bee or um, or drone is is uh, going to keep a hive alive. And even a queen, the queen can't do it by herself. She needs worker bees to you know feed the brood. And um, so think of it as like a a super organism. They all have to work together because if they don't, then they all die. So, and then um, honeybee, you'll often see it spelled as one word. It's actually two words. Um, I'm not a stickler on this, but I thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, in science, in nomenclature, they they determine whether things are one word or two words based on if they are a true version of that thing. So butterflies and dragonflies not being true flies are one word, but house flies are two words because they are true flies. So um, a honeybee is two words because it's a true bee. Now we're getting into honeybee communication. Uh, there's a couple ways bees communicate. One of them is pheromones, which is just uh, like chemicals that they release and sense. Um, one of the main ones is queen mandibular pheromone. Uh, the queen produces that with her mandibular glands. And um, she has a, a retinue, um, which I think there's a picture of it coming up. But basically, there's a, there are bees that surround her, worker bees that surround her. And it's really interesting because they all face her. The whole bee retinue is facing her. And basically, they're taking care of her, but they're also taking chemical messages from her and passing it off to the rest of the hive. So queen mandibular pheromone is actually physically passed through food and anything that's passed on from, from uh, the retinue to the other worker bees in the colony. And... The usefulness of queen mandibular pheromone is that it lets the hive know the condition the queen is in. So it lets them know if the queen is, uh, you know, if she goes missing, if, if you were to pluck her out of the hive, that pheromone would be reduced greatly and they would go into panic mode because they would be like something happened to the queen. Uh, if it if it gradually, if it's still there, but it gradually gets weaker and weaker, they know they either have a, a queen that is failing or more likely... Um, they know that their hive is so congested. They have so many bees in there that it, it's just not the concentration of it is so low being passed around. And that's when you start getting into um, where they want to swarm because they there's just so low of a concentration of that pheromone to all the bees in the hive that they they know it's it's too uh, too congested and they need to move on and, and split the hive. And we'll talk about swarming here in a little bit. Um a little side note, there's a picture here of a, uh, they call it a temp queen. It's, this is actually a lure that is, uh, it has queen mandibular pheromone embedded into it. And if you ever, you don't have to buy this, but it's only a few dollars. So I thought it was kind of neat. If you uh, ever stumble upon a hive that is queenless and you just, you can't find the queen and, and uh, no signs of her, there's no eggs or anything, you can actually put these lures inside the hive and it will prevent the the pheromone from getting so low that you start having laying workers, worker bees trying to, to lay eggs. And of course, like I said, they can only lay drone brood. And uh, so you could put that in there to prevent laying workers until you are able to get a new queen, maybe like a week or so. Um, let's see another, oh, went too far. Uh, another pheromone is alarm pheromone. And when you hear someone say alarm pheromone, they almost always mean this first one that I've listed, which comes from the uh, Koshevnikov gland. It's at the base of the stinger and you, uh, you'll you smell that eventually. It's uh, It smells like bananas because it includes, um, one of the ingredients of it is isoamyl acetate, which is what gives bananas their their scent. And so uh, if you ever smell bananas in the in the apiary, that's not a good sign. That means they're uh, they're not happy and they're stinging. So um, and you'll also smell that if you come across a, a robbing situation, which we'll talk about um, anytime they're setting off alarms like something's wrong. That's the smell you'll smell. And then they also have another alarm pheromone that they're not actually sure uh, what it what it's used for exactly, but they do know that um, it's released when they bite things like wax moth larvae 
or uh, varroa mites, and it actually paralyzes them and causes them to fall down and, and die. So it's very useful. And they think that it might also mark those pests as being intruders. So they're recognized immediately. Um, another common pheromone is brood pheromone. And uh, this is just the pheromone that the uh, the brood and the brood nest release that uh, the more concentrated it is, that means there's more brood to care for. And that tells the the foragers like that they need to keep busy because they have a lot of, of uh, brood that they need to take care of. So it stimulates increased foraging. Um, and if there's, if, you know, the brood lessens, then the foragers know like, oh, okay, there's not as much brood now, you know, maybe we don't have to be quite so crazy with the foraging. And then one of my favorites is the uh, Nasanov pheromone. If you look at these bees that have arrows pointed to them, they have their um, their abdomens pointed up in the air, but then the tip, like right where the stinger is, actually folds down a little bit and it exposes this little gland called the Nasanov gland. And uh, while they're doing that, you can't tell by the picture, but they're also fanning their wings and that spreads that, spreads that pheromone. And uh, what this does is it tells the other uh, worker bees, like this is home, come here, this is where you're supposed to be. So you'll see this uh, a lot of times when you install a new hive, when you install bees into a new hive, uh, you'll dump the bees in and, you know, the queen will be in there. And then the, uh, some of the worker bees will go out to the entrance and they'll actually start fanning that pheromone to let all the stragglers know, like, this is where you're supposed to go, come here. And then there are dances that bees do. Uh, no matter how many times I read these, I can never, I can never remember all the details of them. But uh, they're pretty interesting. It's really interesting that someone actually studied this and figured it out. But they have found that bees communicate to each other uh, with waggle dances, where they will, uh, if they find some good forage, like they find a field of you know, some kind of flower that has a ton of nectar, they'll fly back to the hive and the way they position their body uh, on the on the frame, it tells the other bees who are watching this dance, it tells them like what direction in relation to the sun the forage is. And then uh, it's like how however many seconds they do the dance for is a translation to how many meters away the food source is. And however enthusiastic they are, like that determines like, or that shows how, just how excited they are about this. Like it's a really good source. So they'll actually dance less uh, extravagantly if it's a, a mediocre food source. Um, and then they have another dance. You can see the pictures here of the different dances. Um, they have another dance called the round dance that's used for things that are really close to the hive. So like within a hundred meters, they're just like, hey, there's something. There's something out there really close. Go look for it. It's a little less specific. There's the, oh, I guess you couldn't see the pictures yet. So here's the the photos. Sorry, I could see them, but you couldn't. Um, so the one on the left is the round dance. And these are from, I don't know if you can see this book. It's ABCs and XYZs of bee culture. It's a really good book. It's a basically a bee encyclopedia, honeybee encyclopedia. I've gotten tons of knowledge from that. Um, and then the one on the right is the the waggle dance and it shows like the relation to the sun and how they how they do their dance and how long. Uh, and then there's a few other, I didn't know where to put these, but these are just other behaviors you'll see. Uh, washboarding is one and washboarding is when the bees, they, there's nothing wrong. They just are on the outside of the hive and they literally just walk back and forth. They just walk, you know, two steps back, two steps forward, and they just do it repeatedly. And a lot of times there's a bunch of them doing it and they don't actually know why they do that, but they gave it a name washboarding. And, uh, there's theories about, you know, they're smoothing rough surfaces and there's a whole bunch of theories out there. But uh, there's no conclusive uh, reason as to why why they do it. Another one is called festooning, and I actually took that picture there. It's uh, it's where bees will 
it's it's associated definitely with comb building. They only do it when they're building comb. And um, there are theories again. One theory is that they use it to to measure the distance. You can see that they're clinging from one frame to the next. So the theory is that they're measuring the distance between the frames to help them build their comb out to the right uh, depth. And then uh, there's another theory that they're just using it as scaffolding to pass along the, the beeswax and from their um, abdomens. And then the third observed behavior is uh, trophallaxis. That's when you'll see bees that are like mouth to mouth passing food, transferring liquid food back to each other. And um, they say oftentimes that has, uh, there's pheromones, there's chemical communication going on. And now on to temperature control. I have two slides on this. Uh, so bees have their ways of keeping cool when it's hot outside and keeping warm when it's cold outside. So when it's, when it's hot outside, what they do is, um, well, first of all, many of them will just remove their bodies from the hive, which is what you see in this picture. Um, that's called bearding. The bees will just come out and they'll just hang out outside the hive because it just removes their body heat from, from the hive. So that helps in itself. And then there are foraging bees that will go and they'll forage for water and they'll spread little droplets of water all over the, the frames inside. And while they're doing that, there will be other bees that are outside right here on the um, at the entrance and they will be fanning air into the hive. And the combination of the water droplets on the frames and the air uh, fanning through causes an, an evaporative cooling effect. So it's sort of like us sweating to cool down. Um, so those are the ways that they keep cool. And then in the winter or when the temperatures get down, you know, 50 degrees, they start to cluster inside the hive and they, they literally just form a ball and there's frames in between it, but there's, it's a, it's a ball of bees. And um, the outside of the, the cluster of the ball is, is uh, really dense and it's really um, tight. And all the bees are really tight together and it's creating like an insulation. And then the further into the inside you get, it's a little looser. And um, at the very middle is the queen because she's the most important one to keep alive. So the queen is always in the middle, keeping warm. And all the other bees actually rotate from being on the outside to being on the inside and then back. And that's how they keep warm so that no bee is too cold for too long. They get to like rotate in and out. And um, because the bees at the center of the cluster are more loosely compacted, they can actually move around and they can feed on the honey stores that are in the frames, which uh, helps helps fuel their... Um, their movements that they do to keep warm. They actually vibrate their wings and that's how they create warmth inside. And those are actually called heater bees. Um, and then one thing I thought was interesting, I actually just learned this not too long ago, is that the queen, when you have like late, late winter, early spring clusters and they're starting to raise brood again, little small patches of brood, the queen will actually intentionally leave open cells in the brood. She'll intentionally have kind of a spotty brood pattern. And the reason for that is because the heater bees will heat themselves up and they'll go into those cells and they'll keep the surrounding cells of brood warm for up to 30 minutes they found. So, so that's how they, they keep warm in the winter. Let's see if I missed anything. Oh yeah, so the uh, inside, they want to keep the inside of the, the cluster, they want it to be like 94 degrees, especially when there's brood. Um, if there's no brood, it can be down to 70, according to some sources um, from people who have studied this more than I have. Um, but the ambient temperature inside a, a beehive when in the dead of winter can be like 59 degrees. It's just inside the cluster that it gets so warm. And finally, getting into some beekeeping so beekeeping supplies that you'll need, um, hive tool is very important. That one right here 
it's uh, what helps you manipulate frames. So there's a little hook on the end and uh, there's a little pry on the other end. And you use the pry to pry apart the frames before you try to take them out. And then once you've pried apart both ends of the frame, then you use the hook to grab grab the frame and, and uh, pull up one side. And then you grab that frame by the ear, as they call it, and then you pick up the other side and you pull the, uh, the frame out. So these are very necessary. Uh, one thing I would not skip, and it's also very cheap. You can get them for a few dollars. Um, another tool is a smoker. And we'll talk about smokers. Mine's falling apart, but it's uh, just a device used to puff smoke to uh, calm the bees and distract the bees. And then uh, protective gear, uh, people vary on this. Um, I would say starting out, I would definitely use protective gear. I still use protective gear, um, a little less so than I used to, but um, I still use it. Uh, a veil is definitely necessary. Um, I would say that's the bare minimum. Um, gloves, they can be nitrile gloves. I don't really like the big leather gloves because they're so bulky, it makes it hard to, to control what you're doing. Um, if you really don't want to get stung, but you want to keep your dexterity, the best thing I think is um, dish gloves, reusable dish gloves. They're just, uh, they're not too bulky, but they're pretty thick and they, I've never gotten stung through dish gloves. So um, that's a good one. A cloth inner cover, we'll talk about that in a second. It's basically just a piece of cloth that you can put over the frame so that not all the bees can fly up at you at once. Uh, queen clip, I think I have one here. Yeah. Well, there's a picture of one there anyways. It's that little clear clip. Uh, that's if you need to remove the queen briefly from the hive. And there's a few reasons why you might do that. It basically is this little clip that safely isolates the queen. Um, a queen marking device, also pictured there. It's, uh, I actually do have one of those here. It's this little, got junk on it. It's this little wire device. It's got spikes on one side and it's got a wire top. And basically this is my favorite kind of queen marking device because you just find the queen wherever she is on the frame and uh, you push this down over her. So not hurting her. You don't want the spikes to touch her, um, but you push this down over her and basically she will be underneath this uh, screen making it really easy to to mark her through the screen if you want to be able to find your your queen bee more easily you could mark her with paint um a bee brush uh i almost never use a bee brush so if there was something you were going to skip on i would say skip on that one but it, it can be useful if you're trying to put a, a hive box back down and there's bees everywhere and you need to move them but they really don't like being brushed um smoking usually works better you can just puff smoke and they move out of the way um, and then, of course, bees. You'll need bees to keep bees. Um, those uh, are usually best obtained locally. Um, if you can reach out to like your local beekeeping organization, they, I'm sure bees are available. Like we're in Boston. They're not available till March, but I'm sure they're available earlier in the South. Um, but yeah, if you can check with them as best if you can get them locally, because then you don't have to, they don't have to travel all that much further uh, than where they came from to get to your apiary. And then there's the hive components. These are all things that you'll need. Although there are books on making your own, uh, I think better be the, uh, the beekeeping supply company. I believe I've seen a book on their website about building your own equipment. So if you're more of a, a handy person and you want to build your own you might go that route um but i've never built my own i've always just purchased them so from let's do bottom to top from bottom to top there's the bottom board that's just the floor of the hive and then you have your uh your first hive body which is just a, a deep box um some people use medium sized boxes but we'll get into that in a little bit um but that's your brood box that's where the baby bees will be raised up and that's where the queen will reside and then I don't know if you can see on the picture, right on this little strip, right on top of the uh, 
the bottom board is called an entrance reducer. And I think I have one here somewhere. Maybe not. Eh, oh, well, it's a little strip of wood that um, basically it does what the name implies. It just reduces the entrance to a more defensible size. So, you know, usually it's, you know, I don't know exactly how long, but it's it's a pretty wide entrance. And that leaves a lot of openings if, um, you know, robbing bees wanted to come in and rob out your hive. It's really hard to defend that big of an opening. But if you can reduce that opening to, you know, three inches or even more to like a three quarters of an inch, then that's super easy for your guard bees to defend. Um, on top of the brood box, there's a queen excluder. Some people do not use these. I do. I use them. Um, these are just like a metal um, slatted, I don't know what you'd call it. It's like just a, a device that has, it has little slats in it that are wide enough for the bees, the worker bees to crawl through but they're not wide enough for the queen because she's bigger. She can't crawl through the uh, the queen excluder. So basically what it does is it keeps the queen from going up into your honey super and laying eggs, um, and which basically means that the super will be reserved only for honey because there's nothing else they're going to put up there. Um, and then uh, and then you can add honey supers on top. You'll, you'll need to probably um, if they start running out of space. You'll add more honey supers to store more honey. And then uh, whatever your top honey super is, on top of that, you'll have an inner cover and then the outer cover. And you can see the inner cover in the photo. In the middle, it has a little slot in it. And that's for if, if, you, need to, um, if you need to feed your bees. Like when you first install a package, they don't have, there's no forage out. It's too cold. So you can feed the bees so they can have something to build comb with. And um, you would put your feeder right over the top of that hole. And then you would put a box surrounding the feeder. We'll go into that in a second, but um, just so you know what that little slat slats for. And then uh, we can talk about frames. So I have both wood and plastic frames and they both have pros and cons. I love, and most beekeepers will talk about the smell of the wood frames. It's just, there's something about the the wax and the honey and the wood all together. It's like a really uh, nice smell and it feels more natural with the wood. Um, the plastic is nice also because it is way more sturdy. Uh, I've never had a, a frame, when I go to pull out a frame with my hive tool and I go to pull it up, I've never had the frame fall apart with a plastic one. Um, some of the older wooden frames, the nails are a little loose and the top will pop off. And um, I think I still prefer the wood, but I can see why some people would prefer the plastic. Also, if you ever get a um, an infectious disease like American foul brood and you have to, and by the way, I've been doing this for 10 years. I've never had that. So I'm not trying to cause unnecessary fear. But if, if you did have that, the what you're supposed to do to keep it from spreading is to burn all of your supplies and it's uh much better and and easier to burn wood than it is to burn plastic so one other note um and then we were talking earlier about foundation um whether or not to use foundation this is the foundation again it's the little sheet that goes inside the frame and uh it does a few things um it gives the bees something to build their comb on it it makes it easier for them to get started um, but also you can see the little divots i don't know if you can see me because i can't see myself but the little divots those are the size of worker cells and so this is actually designed to um to sort of coerce the, the worker bees into building worker comb as opposed to building drone comb. Um, and the reason for that is because we want more worker bees. We want more foragers out foraging for, for nectar to make honey. And, and uh, you know, we want a more populated hive, more robust hive. Um, if you look at this top picture, this uh, is a picture I took over at um, Beekeeper's Warehouse um 
it was uh, Nancy Mangie and she was showing me this. If you have a frame that does not have foundation, this is how they tend to build the comb. They build it way, way more drone brood that you can see there on the left, the bigger cells. There's way more of it than there, than there would be with foundation. So here it's like half of this is drone brood and the other half is worker brood. So that's why a lot of people prefer to use foundation. One of the reasons. Another reason is that if you're going to extract honey by using an extractor and you're going to spin it around, um, the comb holds up way better if it has foundation in it. If you if you don't have foundation, it can collapse. The, the comb can collapse while you're trying to spin it. I've heard of some people successfully doing it by spinning it super slowly for a really long time. So it's not impossible, but uh, it's much easier to extract honey using an extractor if you have foundation. Um, and then also it, it uh, keeps the, the comb straight. The bees will uh, build it much more straightly with the, uh, not much more, but more straightly with the, with the foundation. Um, so now here's the, what type of foundation question. So there's beeswax foundation and there's plastic foundation. And the beeswax foundation, again, is, you know, seen as being a little more natural because it's just 100% beeswax that's been pressed into a, that shape. Um, and I do think the bees are, uh, I don't think anyone would argue that it's the bees take to it more quickly. Um, so those are the perks of that. The plastic, the perk to the plastic is that um, if you ever need to exchange out your comb, you want to get rid of the old comb and have them build new comb, you can literally just scrape it off and reuse it. You don't have to buy more foundations. So it's reusable. Um, so there's that going for it. But if you're going to use plastic, uh, make sure you get plastic foundation that has been pre-coated with several coatings of beeswax. Because if they just send plastic and you don't coat it yourself with beeswax, uh, it, they're going to be very much less likely to, to accept it. And it has to have beeswax, melted beeswax rolled onto it for them to uh, recognize it as foundation. And then there's the option of going foundationless, which is just doing away with foundation altogether. Um, there's a lot of perks to this. Uh, one of them is that a lot of people like um, cut comb, where you literally, instead of putting honey in a jar, you just cut the comb and you serve it as is with the wax and the honey all together. Um, so if you do, if you want to do that, you could get these little starter strips in the top photo there. These are like foundation, but they're just a starter strip at the very top that gets them going. And then they do the rest on their own. Um, or you could do something like down here at the bottom, there's Ross rounds. I think I'm going to try these this year, but I haven't used them yet. Um, but these are basically um, a system where the bees build the, the, cut comb right into the container that you sell it in or you consume it yourself in. So they, you basically just uh, take these out and put a lid on it, put your label on it and it's good to go as is. Um, so those are a couple options. There's also some, I've seen some folks use Mason jars that they put in there. You can, there's all sorts of things on the internet you can find for making cut comb. Oh, one other perk I want to say for um, for for this, and, and another way you could harvest it, by the way, instead of just doing cut comb, you could actually remove remove all the comb and crush it up and strain it. That's called the crush and strain method. So you just uh, take out all the honey honeycomb and crush it all up, and then you strain the honey out of it. So you have one container of beeswax and one container of honey, and then you can use that wax to make you know, candles or whatever you want. And um, one other perk to doing that is that you always have fresh comb because one of the issues with comb is that it can, if you keep it in the hive too long, it could have a buildup of things. Like there could be like pesticides that bees brought in from flowers and it slowly over time builds up in the comb. Um, 
so if you wanted to just keep recycling out your old combs, that's a, a good way to do it. So I think now might be a good time to check and see if there's any questions. I don't see any questions on the chat, but does anyone have any questions? You can take yourself off mute. I have a question. Yep. So when you got started, did you have like a minimal amount of like supplies that you needed to start and then just build upon there? Like, a, yeah, a, I don't know if if anyone else is in the same boat as me, but I'm starting from scratch with not no knowledge. I'm just starting to learn and teach myself and what it is that I'm going to need to get started. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've definitely, my wife will attest to this. I've accumulated way, way too many tools over the years. I would say the only things you really need are the hive itself, the bees, and a, a hive tool. Um, and the, like the frames that go in the hive, obviously. Um, and if you want to use foundation, you'll need foundation, but you won't a smoker, I feel and like a veil that. and a veil to protect your face. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah definitely. <laughs> a, veil, yeah. Um, a veil for sure. A lot of my protective gear is um, I actually prefer just using stuff that I already had before. Um, sometimes I wear my my jacket, but a lot of times I'll just wear like a hoodie and throw my veil on and I'll have, um, you know, jeans and, and boots on. And so really a veil, um, a hive tool and a smoker, um, and then just your hive. I think that's probably plenty to get started. Okay. And how long does it usually take before you are able to get some of the supply of honey? How long does it usually take them before you can um, take some out? Or is that like a gradual, you just do like periodically? Uh, it kind of depends on the, the colony. Like this year I had hives that, um, that I didn't take any honey from at all. And then I had a hive that I took like 19 gallons from. Oh, wow. Okay. So some of them, sometimes you'll have like a really productive hive that just keeps making honey. And and uh, we'll get into like how, how to know when to like add a new box. And um, so basically like when you start running out of space, you add another box and then they start building up into that. And then if oh. they start running out of space again, you add another box and you just keep building upward until uh i mean the sky is the limit um and then basically you just check for your area um how much you know local beekeepers in your area how much they have found how much honey you need to go into winter and so if you live somewhere where it's uh you know really long winters then you might have to keep you know keep more honey in the hive for them to survive um and if you live somewhere with a shorter winter you might be able to take a bit more um but I would say we usually harvest uh, June, I want to say, um, and we and we well, late June, early July. Yeah, and we start um, in usually in March. Our, our beekeeping season starts. Okay. So. Um. So there's some questions from the chat. Uh, yeah. the first question is, can you do a combo of a foundation and foundation lists? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've actually uh done that a little bit. Although I can't say it was on purpose. Um, yeah, you can do some frames that have foundation and let them build off of that and then have some that are foundationless. It might take them a little bit longer if you don't have like a starter strip uh, to get started on that frame. Uh, but yeah, you can definitely do that. Or you can do, I think what I was going to do next year is I was going to get the Ross rounds and um, put a regular honey super on top and like have them fill out that honey and then on top of that put the ross round so i could also have cut comb but yeah you can you can mix and match that's no problem another question is can you freeze honey or honeycomb yes uh you actually are supposed to freeze the if you're going to do cut comb you're supposed to freeze that because um and, and you can freeze any honey but cut comb is really supposed to be frozen because you're uh you're basically cutting out the the wax with the honey and you're putting it in a container and there's a chance we're going to talk about wax moth and all these things that there could be eggs in there that 
where you could have like pests that start developing and you could have honey that's filled with worms and looks disgusting. So you're actually supposed to freeze, cut comb. Uh, I'm not sure for how long. I think it's it's probably a few days because that's what it is when we store our frames. Um, we always freeze our frames before we put them in storage for the winter. What was the name of the company that had the plans to make your own hive? That was on, there's a book on Better Bee. Um, Better Bee. Yeah. Okay. So I'm that sure. is Better Bee. Um, another question, just going to keep things moving along here. Is there a particular place to put the hives on your property? And I, I just want to remind you, Tyler, that we have a hunch here about something we noticed this year, but go ahead. Oh yeah. Uh, and that's actually coming up. Um, okay. Do you all want me to cover that on the next slide? Cause that's. Oh yeah. So we will, we'll just skip over that question. If we're going to be covering it here soon. Um, another question from the chat is do bees like the company of other hives? Should I start with more than one hive or just one? Um, most people recommend that you start with two. Um, and the reason being is because uh, you can get, you can see the differences between the two. And also if, if like one hive just uh, wasn't doing well and it was just doomed to fail, uh, at least you still have the other one. Uh, but also you can see, you'll learn a lot more. You'll learn double the amount from having two different hives because you can, you just get more exposure. Um, so I would recommend starting with two. Okay, and we might be covering this next question. So just confirm, does the hive need to be in a spot that gets a lot of sunlight or is under a tree okay? Uh, yeah, it's on the next slide too. Okay. Uh, another question is, do you freeze the entire hive boxes when you freeze the frames? Uh, nope, I take out the frames. I actually have a slide on this too, but I take out the frames. I put them in um, bags called freeze frames. Um, freeze frame bags, those are also on Better Bee. I swear they don't pay me. Um, but there's bags called freeze frame bags that, uh, fit perfectly. They fit a frame perfectly and you can, is there any advantage to doing that versus just putting the entire box in the freezer? If you have the space to do so? Um, no, you could put the entire box in. We just have a tiny freezer. All right. Okay. And that covers all the questions from the chat. Awesome. And I'll cover those other two here in this next, next slide or next couple slides, I think. Um, okay, so when you're preparing for bees and you buy your hive components, um, I always get mine from a, a local person, so mine are always um, the same, but I've read people complain about how different manufacturers, um, their measurements are slightly different than others. So I would recommend buying, if you're going to buy a, a hive, that you buy all the components of, at least of that hive from the same manufacturer so that everything fits properly. Um, so you'll need boxes, uh, a bottom board. We talked about that on the other frame, I guess, uh, an inner and outer cover. And let's see. So yeah, you want to make sure that you're where you're putting your hive. You want to make sure that it's level because, uh, the bees will build their comb straight up and down, whether or not your hive is level. Um, some, I mentioned in here, some people will have like the slightest of tilts forward just so that if rain lands on the the uh, bottom board it it rolls out as opposed to rolling back um but it should really be pretty level uh, a hive should be a couple feet off the ground one to two um so that skunks and raccoons and anything else that wants to get into it uh it, it has a little bit more difficult of a time um, and then here's the question that someone else asked. Um, yeah, you should try to set up your hive uh, facing east or southeast to increase sun exposure. Um, I actually learned that. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say I learned this late. Oh, I'm too far. I learned this later than I should have. And uh, I kind of noticed it myself. I noticed that the hives that were facing east were were way more likely to survive than the ones that weren't. Um so yeah, that's definitely a consideration um, that you want to increase sun exposure by having them face east or southeast. Um, you also want to make sure you have access to both sides of the hive so you can move freely around. Um, one mistake people make is they'll put a bunch of hives super close to each other 
and I mean, they make it work, but it's, it's way easier if you can actually get in from the side and not have to stand right in front of the hive where the bees are trying to fly out. Um, so yeah, I would say leave at least a couple feet between them. And then, um, and then there's this thing called the, the flight path, which is basically, uh, when bees fly out of a hive, what they do is they fly straight out and then they fly up. And if you can put something like, say, like we have a scenario, for example, where not too far in front of our beehives, there's actually a sidewalk, but we're on a hill. So we're raised way up off the sidewalk. And then in, in addition to that, we put a six foot fence in front of the hives. So the bees are forced to fly out and go straight up right away. And by the time they get to the sidewalk, they're, they're so high up that you can't even see them. So it really uh, does a lot to, to keep bees from, you know, running into people. If you're in like an urban setting, um, you can also use um, like hedges. We tried some, um, some trees, some evergreens for a little bit there. Um, and then, oh yeah. And if you, if you just want to be really sure not to uh, upset anyone, you can check with your neighbors and like the legalities here in Boston. Like if you call, uh, and I've had a few people tell me this, whether it's bees or chickens or anything, if you call, they're always kind of like, wait, are you reporting yourself? Or are they, is anybody complaining? Cause like, why are you calling us? Like if we don't care unless someone else cares. So um, you might just check and see what your town's like. And if people care, thankfully uh, we have really great neighbors who love it. And, you know, they get soap from us and honey and everything else. So, um, so we've had a good go of it. Um, and then there's another consideration. Uh, I started this just a few years ago. So most people starting out start with double brood chambers, which means you have two deep boxes of brood. Um, although they usually fill the second one with, with honey, but, uh, you have two deep boxes and then, um, and then you start putting your supers on top of your deep boxes. But there's a thing called the single brood chamber method, SBC, where instead of doing that, you give the bees one box, one brood box, and then you put the queen excluder on top so the queen cannot get out of that one box unless she leaves the hive. Um, and then you put your super on, on top and you start getting honey right away. And the, the perk to this is that you get a lot more honey because um, they just get started. As soon as they fill up that first box, they start making honey. One of the downsides is that um, you have to be careful going into into fall. You have to make sure you feed them sugar syrup in order for them to and and also just um, take off the honey super and give them enough time to build up their stores for winter before. So you're basically just sort of taking the honey early and then uh, giving them time in the fall to fill back their their honey stores for the winter. And when you do that, you have to feed them sugar syrup and and uh, in order for them to have enough food to get through the winter. Um, yeah, another con of this method is that you have to monitor it very closely because if they run out of space, they'll swarm. So, and they have a lot less space with this method. So you have to be in the hive like once a week where you can be a little more relaxed, maybe um, every 10 days to two weeks if you had um, two, two deep boxes for them to use. Um, picking bee varieties, if you just want the, like, like what's the easiest, what's the best for a starter, I would say, I don't think anyone would say, uh, anything other than Italian. Italian is like the go-to honeybee. They're gentle. They're good producers. Um, they're really easy to work with. They're not particularly inclined to swarm. Um, it's not that they can't be any of those things, but they're just, um, way more reliable than most others and you know there's other breed, breeds here you can see on the photo you wouldn't keep africanized bees because those are the really aggressive ones um buckfast bees those are um a variety of bees that were developed in england to uh, overcome a certain disease that was uh, some historical disease that took out a lot of hives a long time ago and uh, a lot of people like them because they they say they're very productive and that they're calm. Um, I would say it's hard because uh, 
that might be true generally speaking and if you went to like the university of guelph has a, a breeding program where they be, breed buck fast queens on an island so it's very secure but if just the regular run-of-the-mill um breeder it's gonna be really hard to keep uh, outside genetics out of out of the pool so it's uh we got buck fast we i think both of our buck fast colonies were actually pretty aggressive um so it's not a it's not a sure thing unless you have some kind of assurance that the breeding program is really tight um so yeah i would say go with italian there's another option called um Baroa sensitive hygiene which as far as i'm aware is mostly italian honeybees um and this is basically just bees that were um bred to for their for their sensitivity to uh, being clean basically they whenever they had uh mites that they would see varroa mites in the in a cell they would rip them out and take them outside they would kill them um and they were just like very hygienic bees and whenever the the people who made this variety they would work with those kinds of bees to develop this super hygienic bee that would be um very effective at minimizing its own varroa mites so um we often try to get the varroa sensitive hygiene trait if it's available and it usually is. Um, then there's the question of there's the question of uh, packages versus nucleus colonies. So a package is like a few pounds of bees in a box like this that you see in the picture. Um, I think I've come to the conclusion that this is my preferred method and I'll explain why um, to get packages over, over nucleus colonies. So they are cheaper. Um, they're just bees. You don't, they don't come with any, um, any brood or, or frames or comb or anything like that. Um, you just have like this ball of bees and a queen and uh, it takes them a little bit longer to get going because they don't have any, any stores of anything and you have to feed them right away. Um, and also the queen that's with them is not necessarily, they're not adapted to that queen yet. They don't necessarily accept her. They just can't do anything to her because she's in a cage. Um, so that's a little bit about packages. And then there's nucleus colonies, which are basically small hive boxes that come with four or five frames. This one has five, five frames of bees. And they cost a little bit more money because they come with all this stuff. They come with frames and those frames have, have brood in them. They have honey and pollen. And basically you're getting a colony that's already up and running. And so its chances of failing are a little less than starting out with a package of bees. Um, the reason I say that these are not my preference anymore is that you don't know what you're getting with that comb there if if that apiary has um diseases going around you could be introducing a disease to your apiary that you didn't know about and obviously didn't want and um so that i don't know if it's worth the risk um uh, plenty of people say that it is and plenty of people uh go straight for nucleus colonies so feel free to to make that decision um but that's why I personally have started to appreciate packages over nucleus colonies. Um, although it is really nice to have these boxes, you know, you can use them down the line, down the road. If you need to make a, a split, which we'll talk about soon, um, you can use, you can reuse these boxes. They're pretty handy. Uh, let's see. Now we'll talk about installing bees. Okay. So one general tip is that you, definitely want to have your hive set up in advance. You want to have everything. You don't want to be like trying to nail things together when your bees are waiting for you to put them in their, their hive. Um, we've already talked about the hive components, bottom board, brood box. Um, if it takes you a long, a, a little bit longer to, to get the bees into the, into the hive, you can consider spraying them with a room temperature, uh, one-to-one -one sugar syrup. It just kind of gives them something to do. They, just a couple sprays, it kind of um, 
you know, gets them kind of eating the sugar syrup off them off themselves and cleaning themselves up. And it also kind of makes them stick together a little more when you're putting them in the in the hive. Um, I don't usually do that unless they've been been sitting for a couple of days. Um, also, another tip is if you're installing a new package, don't don't use smoke because as we saw earlier with the Nasanov gland, those bees are going to be trying to tell the other bees where to go. And the purpose of smoking them is to basically mask all of their communication so that they can't uh, launch a, an attack on you. Um, so um, so I would not use smoke when installing a, a new hive, a new package of bees into a hive. Um, and then coming up on these next slides, slides I'm going to do a literally a step-by-step -step with photos on how to install bees. And then after these photos, um, I actually have a little video. It's maybe a minute and a half long, and you can actually see it all put together. So, um, okay, so the first step is you're going to remove the cover uh, that is on top of the box that covers up this um, sugar syrup can. So you remove the cover. It's just stapled down. So you just pry it off with the, um, the hive tool. And then step two is you're going to remove that can and it's kind of hard to get a grip on because it's pretty well in there but while you're removing it i don't know if you can see on the left side of that can there's a little metal strap and that is actually a strap that's holding on to your queen cage so you actually have to hold on to the queen cage with hold on to that strap with with one hand and then remove the frame or remove the the can with your other hand uh, if you don't do that then when you remove the can the queen will fall down into the ball of bees and you'll have to reach down into a box of bees to grab the queen which i've had to do um it's not as bad as it sounds um so once you get the can removed you set the queen to the side and um you cover the the hole back up that you left a hole because you removed that can you cover that hole back up with the um the wooden cover so that the bees don't just fly out there will be some that get out but most of them will be still stuck inside. Um, so now that you have your, your queen cage out and all of your other bees are still in the box with the cover on it, um, you want to open up your queen cage, not all the way. There's, there's corks on both ends. And one of those ends has a, um, has fondant. You can see in the picture there, you can see this white substance that's blocking the hole. So one of the ends, uh, Underneath the cork, it actually has a little bit of, uh, they call it bee candy, that's blocking the, the entrance. So when you remove the cork, you're not letting the queen out. You're just exposing that candy. And only one side has that candy. So make sure you remove the cork from the right side. Because if you remove it from the other side, there's just an open doorway for the queen to get out. So you'll remove the, the candy plug and cork. And then... You will rubber band the, the queen cage to a frame that's going to be in your brood box. It's going to be in the middle of the brood box. So you'll rubber band it, and you want to do it so that the – you can actually see the top of that queen cage, that white stuff. That's, that's that bee candy that's blocking the hole on the top. So you want to put it with the hole face – like the fondant facing up. And the reason for that is because – Inside that cage with the queen is often a few other bees, like other attendant bees that are taking care of her. And if they die, which they often do, um, they'll fall to the bottom of the cage. And if that's where the hole is for her to get out, then the, the exit will be blocked. So you want to have the exit facing up so that it doesn't get blocked by any dead by dead bees. So then you place that right into the middle of the of the hive. And this is, we use 10 frame boxes. So um, basically in this scenario, there's there's uh, nine frames in the hive right now. And this one's right in the middle. And the one right next to it on the side of the bee cage is removed. And that's to make room for me to dump all the other bees on top of that queen cage so that they can find her really easily. And that's what I did here. So you can see that gap that I left and I just dumped all the bees right down on top of her and they'll find her really quickly. Um, and then, let's see. 
Um, so I would almost just recommend just waiting. Sometimes I, I will um, just put the inner cover down on top of that and give them a couple minutes to disperse. And then I'll put that last frame back in to fill that gap. Um, if you leave it un, like unfilled, if it's just a gap there, they will start building comb in that and it's going to be kind of a mess. So you don't want to leave it for longer than I would say a day, but I usually replace it after like 15 minutes after they've kind of dispersed through the hive. So after you get that last frame put back in, you can put the inner cover on and that just covers all the bees. And then on top of the inner cover, you can put a feeder and this is a, a feeder with um, sugar syrup. And around that, you put another box. And the box is just to protect the feeder. And so the bees can crawl up through that hole that was in the inner cover. And they can go up through the middle of this feeder. And they can actually um, drink the sugar syrup. And you don't have to buy one of these. A mason jar. You can get a mason jar and... Um, and put a lid on it and then uh, you know fill it with sugar syrup, put the lid on it and poke holes in it with a nail and and then just turn it upside down and the, the suction will keep the, the sugar syrup up so the bees can drink it. And then you can literally just put it on top of two sticks and so the bees can get underneath it and get the get the sugar syrup. So you don't have to buy a feeder. I bought these because um, I like having that entire hole in the inner cover completely covered so that I know that when I go into that box, there's not going to be bees flying at me. So it's just an extra little um, thing that stands in the way. And then um, after you get the feeder in there, you put the outer cover on. And then I mentioned in here that there's, there's actually two things wrong with this picture. I need a uh, entrance reducer at the bottom there because it's still cold and they're not a very strong colony. So that should probably be reduced to about three or four inches. And then also that um, that little hole in the middle there um, is just inviting access from ants and anything else for the, for the sugar syrup. So that should be covered up. And then here's the video and I'll kind of talk as I go through it, but you can actually see it play out and this was on Instagram, so it's got some text on it. But, And you can actually find this on our Instagram if you want to watch it again. Um, okay, so I'm... Oh, man. Let's see. Okay, so I'm taking the outer cover off and then taking the can out while holding on to the bee cage, or the queen bee cage. There's the queen. And then I'm taking that cork out to expose the, the fondant. And then I'm putting that rubber banding that to the frame. And while this is happening, that, that box of bees is completely covered up. So they're, the other bees can't get out. And yeah, the bees will chew through the candy. This is a point I didn't bring up. The bees will chew through that candy to get to the queen and it takes them about a week. So I remove a couple frames, one or two, to make room to dump the, uh, the bees on top of the queen. And then there will still be some bees in the box, and that's fine. And then on this one, I replaced all but one and then came back later to replace that last frame. Then I put my, there's the jar I was talking about. This one actually has a little device holding it up. Inner cover, outer cover. Make sure everything's lined up. And then I can, and then I prop that box up so that the bees can find their way in. So that's that. So yeah, one thing I forgot to mention is that the um, the reason for that candy that's blocking the hole of the queen cage is that um, it allows the worker bees to chew through that and release the queen themselves, but it it makes them take their time. It takes like five days for them to do that. And the purpose of that is so that they won't kill her. Basically, that um, they want to make we want to make sure that they know that that they're like on the same team as that queen when that queen gets released. That they're they're sharing the same pheromones and 
And uh, they're, they're a family at that point by the time they make it to her. So they're way more likely to accept her because they've been around her for several days already. So they chew through and they'll release her. And then you can come back. Um, you can come back a week later uh, to see if she's been released. And if she hasn't been released, you can uh, remove the cork on the other side and directly release her. Because at that point, after a week, it's usually pretty safe. But you can watch her uh, walk down in and make sure she's okay. Um, and then there's this happens sometimes, especially when you get packages of bees in, in March in Boston. Um, the weather's too dreary and cold to install a package of bees. And so you need like a, a different method of doing it because um, it's so cold that if you, they're, they're not going to be flying. If you dump them out, they're just going to be like so cold that their body um, just stiffens up and so you need a, a warmer, a warmer, drier method of installing the bees. Um, if you, if you can wait like a day, if like the weather the next day is, is, uh, is great, or it's like 50 degrees or something, then by all means, I would wait the extra day. But if it looks like it's going to be cold and rainy for the foreseeable future, then you can switch to this method. And there's actually multiple versions of this. You can uh, find people doing it other ways online, but this is the one that I was taught and it's always worked for me. Um, so basically you put all your frames in and you put an extra box on top of your, your brood box and you put the whole package of bees. You haven't even opened it yet. You put the whole thing on top of the frames inside that top box. Uh, you put a feeder next to it, just sitting on top of the frames. I don't know if you can see that glass jar feeder you put that right there then you open your box and you get your queen same as you would if you were installing the bees in good weather um and then you set the queen whoa oh there it is okay you set the queen down right there on top of the frames uh next to the sugar syrup and then you uh, take that top off that releases all the other bees from the box and you just turn it on its side and you put the whole of the, the top of the box, the one you uncovered, you put it right next to the queen cage so that they're going to crawl out of there and they're going to be right on top of the queen and um, and they will basically go right to her and keep her warm. And then, um, yeah, you just... Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Oh. Um, and then you put the inner cover and outer cover on. And then the other thing you might have to do is install a nucleus. And, uh, this is actually pretty easy. Um, literally all you're doing is, um, taking these from one box and putting them in another. Um, so you these bees when you're when you get a nucleus colony these bees already consider this nucleus their home so you will need smoke when you're um, removing the frames from the nucleus colony because they're like hey you're you're taking all of us out of here like this is our home and um so it's not like a package where they don't have a home this is this is their home and you're putting them in a new home so you'll need to use smoke but you only want to use smoke inside the nucleus once you move frames over to the new hive you don't want to be smoking the new hive because then the bees won't be able to find their new home as easily um and i will there's actually a video of this too i think is this a video i think that was the video um sorry i'm very low tech okay this is a video of installing it so you're going to crack the the lid of the nucleus and smoke them gently. And like it says here, you already have a queen brood and, and resources that they're trying to protect. So they're going to be angry at you. So you smoke them a little bit and then you take out each frame and you try to find the queen. There she is. It just makes you sleep better at night if you can see the queen because <laughs> you know she's in there and literally you're just um i guess i didn't mention this but you're you're putting um 
whatever you have on the on the outer sides like um you're gonna put these five frames in the middle and on the outsides if you if all you have is is um foundation frames then you just put foundation if you have honey you can put a frame of honey on the very ends and uh, basically what this allows them to do is they will basically just continue building where they left off with their five frames they'll start building out to the next frames and then you can prop them just like the package you prop it up by the entrance and they'll find their way in Now, I feel like I've talked a lot about the smoker and I haven't really um, mentioned what it is or how to use it. Um, it's a metal cylinder. Uh, it has a little bellows attached to it that puffs air from a hole out of the bottom of it into the bottom of the, the smoker. And uh, that feeds the fire. And you basically want to start with small fuel to get it going. Um, pine needles work well. Um, burlap that's what i use i use burlap because i get it for free from a coffee shop um and it burns really really nicely um you can use punky wood like little old sticks that are really dry and brittle those work really well um and basically you just want to get a, a really good fire going and you start adding in more substantial fuel like you might add some bigger sticks after you get it going and then once it's full and it's really burning hot then you can um take a few green leaves and just put them right on top and close it up. And those green leaves will turn that, those flames into like a cool white smoke. So you're not spitting flames out of the end of the smoker and burning your bees. Um, so that's sort of how you get it, how you get it going. And the point of a smoker, as I mentioned here is um, it does a couple things. One thing it does is that it makes the bees think that there's like a fire and they start gorging on honey. So it kind of distracts them. They go down in the hive and start consuming honey. And another thing it does is it blocks their chemical communication. So if uh, a bee has like the alarm pheromone going and it's like noticing you as an intruder, it keeps the other bees from like basically jumping jumping on board with them and attacking you. So it's, um, it's really important to have that um, as a tool. Um, I think I mentioned all this. Oh yeah, I, I always keep a little extra quick fuel like burlap nearby so that if I run out of smoke and I'm in the in a really tight spot, I can just toss it in and it keeps the smoker going. Uh let's see, inspection techniques. So hold, hold one sec. Before we move on, I just um want to cover questions. Some questions that came from the chat. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, so um, I think one of the questions was if you had an opinion on frame feeders. Frame feeders. Oh, I have them. Um, I use them. Um, they're not like my go-to, but I use them when I'm doing um, observation hives because I have to put the, the frames of brood in the bottom and it, it sort of um, feeds them. They work really well. Uh, you would... I guess it would take away some of your space for regular frames. So you might have to watch a little more closely to make sure you don't run out of space, but, um, but no frame feeders work really well and they hold a lot of sugar syrup. And it's also another perk is that it's, it's in the hive with the bees. So it might be a little less prone to inviting robbing because it's not as exposed. And, and Tyler, I don't know if you touched on this, but um, when, why do you supply sugar syrup and when do you take it away? Um, so we use sugar syrup uh, mostly in the spring. Uh, it's before and it's with new new packages that don't have any food supplies or any comb. So um, we're basically, we give them sugar syrup in the spring because there's no forage available. So they, they can't get any nectar from anywhere. And without nectar, they can't build comb. They can't store anything. So basically it's, uh, I think it was Nancy Mangian that described it as um, basically putting a Home Depot right there at the site where they can use everything to to build up their comb and start storing away some uh, honey. It's not, it's sugar syrup honey, but it's stores that they can use. Um, and then 
we don't actually take it away until as soon as nectar is available, they won't, they're not interested in the sugar syrup. They'll literally stop. They'll leave a half full jar. And once they have nectar, they just stop taking it. So if you see that it's not going down, you know that they're, they're done with it. Yeah. So I think the, the main takeaway is we give them sugar syrup when they're installed and it's still early spring. Yep. Um, and then we take away the sugar syrup, especially once we start putting the honey boxes on I honey can't. for our consumption. We don't want to be consuming honey that came from sugar, sugar. water. Yeah. Yeah. You can't have a, you cannot have a feeder on with honey supers on because then you're, you don't know if you're getting flower honey or you're getting sugar syrup honey. Um, another thing I forgot to mention is uh, we also feed them in the fall. And that is because um, they are still trying to raise brood for winter bees to get through the winter. And they're doing that. They're still doing that while the forage is getting worse and worse, you know, as the weather's getting colder and colder. And so to allow them to keep raising brood for winter and not have to stop in order to fill those cells with with um, honey to get by for the winter, uh, we give them feed in the fall so that basically as soon as one of the winter bees emerges and is ready to live for the winter, uh, they can use the sugar syrup to fill that cell. It basically just makes sure that as many cells as possible are filled with nectar or honey. Um, even if it's sugar syrup, honey, you're just helping them when there's not very much forage out to really stock up before winter. Okay. Um, another question was how can you mark the queen while she's still in the cage? Um, I wouldn't. I I I you I don't think you could either because the the screen is not um is not very big. This this has like number eight wire, so it's big openings. Um, but the reason I wouldn't is because the queen is so vulnerable in the first days until she's fully accepted. Um, I wouldn't even. We had we had we lost a queen from marking her too early, a week after she had been in the the hive. So I would almost wait a couple weeks before marking her because they are like looking for a reason to not like her. It's like if anything is altered, it, it, she's very vulnerable in those first couple weeks. So um, so I would say uh, I would wait a couple weeks before you even mess with the queen at all. Great. And what do you do if you get a package and the queen dies or the queen is dead? Um, that actually happens. It's never happened to me, but um, usually the provider of the bees, um, and this is another good reason to get them locally, they usually receive a few extra queens for that. And you can go back and get another one from them. Yeah, that's a good question because you can't, you can't see the queen when they're inside the inside the box. And I think there are some providers that keep the queen separate, but most of them come inside the, the box where it's warmer. But you should have a, you might ask the provider if they have a backup plan. Okay. Um, I don't know if this will be covered in a future slide, but how do you know when it's time to remove the honey? Oh yeah, we're gonna go through that. Okay. And what are the fall, winter feeding start stop dates? Um, it really just depends on your area. Um, I see videos from YouTube channels that are in Alabama and Tennessee. And um, and it always amazes me because their stuff is so different. Um, but you you want your bees to be ready for winter by Thanksgiving. This is just the rule of thumb. Um, so everything should be done. They should be all wrapped up and, and tucked away for winter by Thanksgiving. But as far as um, feeding, you can't really feed sugar syrup if it gets too cold out um, because they can't go on cleansing flights. So they won't fly if it's below, it's like 45 degrees or something, 50 degrees. Well, they'll fly in 50. Yeah, probably 45. Um, and so if they whenever they're eating sugar syrup, they need to be able to, to go outside to relieve themselves or else you'll have uh bee poop in the, in the hive. So I would say just before it gets consistently cold and there's times where the weather will be like 60 degrees for a day. And then the next day it'll be like 
40, I'll put out a jar of sugar syrup just on that 60 degree day because they will consume that entire jar easily in the course of a day. We had we had to buy four gallon feeders and they were taking them down in two days. So they, they'll go through it plenty quick if you have a warm day. Um, do you ever use cracked corn for feeding? No, never even heard of that. Okay. Might be a uh, thing. Winter pad I'm gonna you know, winter patties, candy board over winter thoughts. Yeah, uh there are candy board. I think I mentioned that a little bit later. Um they do make candy boards. Those are more like emergency fuel. Some people put them on in advance though. Um, like just in case your bees run out of honey, they have um like a sugar board, a candy board, a fondant, bee candy, whichever you want to call it, um, on top of their hive as an emergency fuel. And then some people make it when it gets like later in the season, if they, cause you can kind of go out and, and they call it hefting the hive. You can kind of lift it a little bit and see how heavy it is. And if you feel like, oh, they feel like they're running low on, on honey, um, you might pick a somewhat warm day to uh, just crack open the top of the hive and put a, put a candy board down. And I think you might be covering that later in a later slide yeah, yeah, about yeah. Uh, beekeeping over the winter. Yeah, I have um, And there's just a couple more questions about the topic that we covered earlier about getting your hive set up. Um, I think there was one question about fencing around your bees to protect from predators. And I think it just depends. You can talk more on this, Tyler, but my thought is just to um, be aware of your situation. I think every person has a unique situation as far as where they live. If they live in an urban setting, a rural setting, do you need to protect yourself from bears? Yeah, um, yeah, then bears maybe a fence would be good. But um, we mainly you know, use our fence just to keep um, passerby <laughs> from seeing that we keep bees. Uh, but yeah, it just really depends on your, your location. I think if you want to have a fence, yeah, um, and, and then I'll go ahead. Ty. People with bears, they often need, a, uh, an electric fence, electric fence around the apiary. Yeah. Um, there was a question about whether to keep your bees under tree cover. Um, I don't know that I would do that. I mean, because they like the sun. I guess it depends on where you live. If you lived in like Arizona right. and you were getting like sun beating down, then I would do it. Um, so many things are dependent on where like your um, your weather. Right. Yeah. And so um, going back to the question of what we actually noticed that the hives that got the most morning sun, so we're really getting that eastern exposure did the best so it seems like you know just like plants like morning sun it seems like bees really like that morning sun as well um <clears throat> but just i think it's good to be cognizant of your area if you're in an area that's really hot then try to keep your hive in a location that will be conducive to keeping them cool if you live in an area that's very cold try to keep them in an area that gets the most sun exposure possible um, there was also a question, one last question about um, clothing, what you do, what uh, clothing you wear when you're inspecting a hive, like dark clothing, white clothing. Have you noticed anything in that regard? Um, they say that white clothing, I've, I've worn both. I don't really notice much of a difference, but they do say that white clothing uh, is less threatening to them. Um, so that's why most bee suits are white, although not all of them are. Um, but yeah, like light, light colored clothing. Um, and I don't know if you need to talk about the, the jacket. There's, there's jackets out there that, um, have the zip up and then they have the hood that goes over with the veil. You don't actually need that. You can just get a veil and wear a sweatshirt. Um, and that'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And just a time check here. I think we're approaching the two hour mark. I know Tyler, you could talk about this all day, but do you think that this is a good stopping point or? Um, I would say let's do the inspection. Okay. And techniques. Cause we could take, right. and so we could take questions until three 30, right? Okay. Yeah. So I guess we'll just go ahead and um, 
continue on. We'll do one last section here. And if you have any questions, again, just go ahead and, and put them in the chat and then we'll try to cover them before the conclusion of today. So yeah, carry on. I might also be able to knock out two, two sections. Uh, there's been a lot that's been covered. Okay. So inspection techniques. Um, so how often to inspect your beehives? It's going to depend on a, a lot of different things. Uh, the time of year, like for example, if you're, uh, I know in Boston, we cannot do a lot of inspections in August because that is robbing season. And so that's a, there's a dearth. And if you open the hive and you expose the smell of honey, all of the bees from all of the hives will go to that hive and try to rob that hive. So um, so August is a very hands-off month here, but it depends on where you, on where you live. You'll have to ask the other beekeepers in your area. Um, it also depends on if you're using the single or double brood chamber method. Like I was saying earlier, like I do every five to seven days, which is kind of disruptive, honestly, but if you only have one box and they're really congested and I mean, a lot can go, the bees can decide to swarm pretty quickly. Um, so I have to stay like on top of every hive uh, in the apiary. But if you had two boxes, um, you know, you could probably get away with seven to 10 days instead of five to seven. And it also depends on the time of year, like um, that five to seven day thing I'm talking about, like during swarm season, um, once swarm season passes and like the, you know, in the summer, then I don't have to inspect quite as often, but, uh, during swarm season, I have to stay, stay on top of it. Um, before doing, uh, an inspection, let's see what it says. Take a moment to think about, oh yeah, what you're looking for. So you want to know before you even go in, you just want to sort of get in your mind, like, what am I looking for? Um, what am I going to do if I see X, Y, and Z, you know, what if I see a, a queen cell, what am I going to do about it? Um, you know, what's you sort of plan ahead and have, you know, a reasonable amount of equipment, um, somewhat in reach so that you can, um, sort of do things more efficiently. Um, of course, no matter how much you plan, this is always going to be a hive that throws you for a loop that just did something you totally didn't expect. And, uh, that's, it's impossible to completely prevent it, but, and the more time you spend doing this, the more you'll prepare, you'll, you'll know what might be happening. Um, yeah. So before inspecting, you want to make sure it's not too cold. Um, yeah, we like to inspect when it's like 60 degrees or more bees will be flying when it's 50 degrees, but I just try not to keep, I try to keep the, the hive closed when it's cold because the brood can get chilled. Um, and I definitely don't want to inspect on rainy or windy days because that really agitates them. Um, and if there's like a really, really hot day, if it's like a hundred and something degrees, uh, they're going to be agitated on those days too. Um, if you start digging through, um, and their, their comb gets kind of soft and it's much more easy to, to ruin some of their comb on a hot day. Cause it's all melty. Um, so inspection begins before you open the hive. So when you walk up to the hive, you should look and see like what the entrance looks like. Good signs to see are bees carrying loads of pollen on those pollen baskets on their back legs. Um, if you see a lot of pollen coming in, that's always a good sign because they're trying to feed brood and uh, that's just a good thing to see. Um, if they seem agitated and they're like bouncing off your veil, you it might just be their genes. They might just be agitated bees that you have to requeen and and get a new get different genetics in there. But they could be perfectly calm bees who um, are just under a lot of pressure. Who are um, you know maybe they have um, some neighborhood pest that's been bugging their hive. You know, is a skunk or something um, that makes them more defensive. So you kind of have to just look at what's going on on the outside and see see if it looks right. Um, inspection techniques. So you have your weather, good weather. You have a plan, you have your hive tool. Always make sure your smoker's going. I can't tell you how many times I've, uh, um, started to go in and realize I don't have my hive tool or I don't have the, the smoker going. Um, this little cloth inner cover, I mentioned it earlier. 
I have one right here, actually. Um, these are a lifesaver. They're super cheap. And they're basically just a cloth that you can lay over the frames after you get inside the hive. And like you see in the picture there, you can leave just one or two frames exposed. So that way it's not like you're opening the entire hive and have all these bees flying out from every frame. You know, it to all the bees in those other eight frames, it just seems like their hive is still closed. So these, I found these to be really helpful. Of course, you don't have to buy that. You could use pretty much any cloth to cover it up. Um, but I do recommend those if you're uh, intimidated by the bees. Um, let's see. Yeah, so how you use the hive tool. I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but you wanna, I don't know how much of this you can see. I have a nuke box here. It's gonna go epically wrong. Um, but basically you wanna use the pry part to pry between the frames to separate them. They're usually way more sticky than that. And then you wanna take the hook and hopefully you can see this. You put the hook down in there and you use it to pry the end of the frame up and then you can grab it with your other hand and then you can go down to the other end and you can um, lift that frame up and then grab it with your hand and then you can pull those out. And you wanna start, there's the entrance reducer I talked about. You want to start, um, you don't want to start in the middle because that's where the brood is going to be. The brood is always in the middle of the of the hive. So you want to start on the end frames. Um, personally, I prefer the second frame in from either side. Um, the second frame in because the first frame is usually glued really well to the wall of the hive. So it's a little harder to get out. So usually I remove the second frame first and I pull it up and you just kind of, you look at it by by holding it like this. And then when you wanna look at the other side, you just kind of turn it up like that to look at it. And usually the frames on the end don't have much going on. It's either a little bit of nectar or honey. Uh, there's probably not any brood in there, almost certainly not the queen. Um, so usually what I do is I, I look at that first frame I pull out and then I lean it on its side up against the bottom of the, the hive box so that it's, um, it leaves room. It gives you an extra frames worth of space to manipulate the rest of the, the frames. Um, and you just kind of work through frame by frame. And um, if you kind of know what you're looking for, you don't necessarily have to look at every, every single frame. Like say, um, you know, you go in, you look, you know, the first few frames are empty. So um, you know they have space. And then uh, you see some eggs and you know that... Um, Eggs are only eggs for three days. So you know you have a, a queen or you've had a queen within the last three days. So even if you don't see the queen, if you see signs of the queen, then um, you know usually you don't have to go all the way through. Um, if you are looking for signs of swarming, you might want to look at like half of the frames or so for um, swarm cells. And I'm going to talk about that coming up here. Um, look for swarm queen cells because that's that's what they do when they're going to swarm. And uh, if you look at like half the frames or so and there's no no swarm cells, chances are they're not preparing to swarm because usually those things are all over the box. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. And um, when you put the frames back into the, the hive, you want to try to put them back the same way you took them out, both in the same order and facing the same direction. I don't do this, but I've heard, I've seen some people use a marker to mark on the frames, like front and rear. So they know that they put the frames, that that side is always the front of the hive and this side's always the rear of the hive. And so they put it back exactly how it was. It just sort of, um, someone once compared it to, like if someone came into your house and just rearranged all the furniture in your living room, it'd be kind of annoying. It's kind of like that. So you want to give it back the way it was. Um, so yeah, once you're working your way through the hive, you want to take notes of what you see, um, either mental notes or or write it down, um, or anything that you need to do. Um, like for example, if um, what is a good example? If you oh maybe you'll take a note of how much brood there is, and then when you want to you come back, you want to check and see how much the brood nest has expanded, how much more brood there is. That way you can know like, oh, last time I was here, there was only two frames of brood and now there's four. So they're clearly building and doing a good job. Um, 
So generally speaking, good things to see, uh, eggs, larvae, and pupae. I'm going to, there's pictures of these on the upcoming slides of exactly what this looks like. Um, let me keep going here. Um, things you don't want to see is a lack of brood, um, a bunch of eggs stuck to, oh, my dog's here, uh, a bunch of eggs stuck to the wall of a cell. That is a sign of a laying worker. We've talked about that, where if a queen is not, um, if a queen is not fully functional, like reproductively, um, sometimes, or if she dies, her queen mandibular pheromone will fade and then the worker or the uh, laying workers will start laying eggs. Usually a laying worker will start laying eggs in those cells to try to um, make up for the lack of brood. But they can only lay male bee eggs, as we mentioned earlier. But the way you spot those is that their abdomens are not nearly as long as a queen's. So they actually are not able to lay an egg at the bottom of the cell. So it always sticks to the wall. And also because they're not good at it, they always lay like three or four or five or six eggs. So you'll see like a ridiculous number of eggs and they won't be at the bottom of the cell. They'll be stuck to the wall. And that's when you know you have a, a laying worker. Um, and that becomes, it gets confirmed when you start seeing a bunch of drone brood. And I'll show you the difference between drone brood and, and worker brood coming up. Uh, but when you see the domed cells of a, of a drone, of drone brood and you don't see any worker brood, yeah, you have a, a laying queen or a laying worker, sorry. Um, but we'll get into that. So that goes on to inspection findings. I think I can get through this real quick. Um, so a good thing, a mental trick is um, that uh, eggs are eggs for three days uh, and then they become larvae for six days and then 12 days is a pupa. That's a, for the worker bees. So it's an easy way to remember like what you're looking at. Like, oh, this egg is three or less days old. This larva, depending on its size, is, you know, anywhere from four to 10 days old. And then um, and then they cap it on day nine. Um, and I you can use this knowledge to, to um, understand what's going on in your hive better. Because if you see, like I said earlier, if you see eggs, even if you don't see the queen, you know the queen's been there within the last three days because eggs are only eggs for three days. So she's been around. And that could give you some relief if you don't spot the queen herself. Here's what I was talking about earlier, the difference between worker brood and drone brood. At the bottom there, you see those domed cells. That's drone brood. That's the male bees. And then the uh, the rest of it, that flat, those flat cells, those are all worker brood. So that's what the female um, brood looks like when it's capped. Um. Yeah, and that's a really good laying pattern. Like you, you see, there's very little, there's very few gaps. There's there's a few um, open cells in here, but those are mostly just ones that just emerged. It's a very solid brood pattern. And here's what I was talking about earlier with a laying worker. You see a lot of um, only drone brood and a spotty pattern. And then if you could look more closely, it would be um, multiple eggs per cell. Um, so there's four things that they forage for, uh, nectar for making honey and for making bee bread, which is bee bread is just pollen with nectar added to it. It's a fermented product because pollen is not very shelf stable and it's not very easy for them to digest. They'll add nectar to it and that's called bee bread. And you can actually see it in the picture there. You can see pictures of bee bread and pictures of nectar. And then they also forage for water for, um, for cooling the hive and then for tree resins for making propolis um which we'll talk about here soon it's basically a propolis is like a bee glue that they use to seal up cracks and uh it's got antimicrobial properties so it prevents diseases as well oh i guess you couldn't see this yet this is what i was alluding to the picture of bee bread and nectar so bee bread's just pollen with nectar and saliva added to it and um then you can see the nectar is just uh, honey that's not finished yet, basically. And then uh, here's another inspection finding. Um, there's capped honey right there. So when bees uh, when bees bring nectar 
back to the hive, it's about 85%, depending on the flower, it's about 85% water. And they have to get that down to about 18% or less um, in order to keep it from spoiling. If there's too much water, there's too much bacteria growth. And so they will fan the honey or fan the nectar until it and, and heat it up until it loses its moisture. And then once they get it down below 18% or even lower than that, then they will put a wax cap on that cell that basically says, this is, this is done. This honey is done. And so you can see on there, there's capped honey, there's uncapped nectar, there's partially capped where they're working on it still. And a lot of beekeepers use this to determine if honey is, I think someone was asking this earlier, this is where um, beekeepers use this to determine if honey is safe to eat or safe to harvest. Um, it's an 80% rule. If 80% or more, some people say, some people say 90, um, but 80 to 90% or more of the, of the honey is capped, then the moisture is likely low enough that it is perfectly safe to harvest. And I use that technique for deciding if my honey was safe to harvest for years and years, I usually waited till it was like 90 something percent capped. But now I actually have a tool that you'll see where you can test the moisture of the honey. Um, but that's how you know if honey is ready or not. It's 80% capped. Uh, these are other findings. Um, you can see the drone brood there at the top, the um, kind of bulbous uh, capping there. And then there's capped queen cells here. This means that they're raising up a new queen uh, for whatever reason. There's at least three of them here. There's one right... Oh, I got arrows pointing to them. And then there's a little bit of worker brood. Um, there's, a general, there's a general rule, but it's not foolproof. If bees build cells, queen cells, in the center of a frame, it's usually a... Um, a supersedure cell. It means that, or an, an emergency cell, like something went wrong with the queen. She's not being nearly productive enough or she died or they just, there's no, no queen laying in there. Um, they will basically use eggs that were already laid that were going to become worker brood and they'll just fashion it into an emergency queen cell. So that's why they don't really look very good. They kind of look like they just took, um, something that was already there and kind of fashioned it into a queen cell. Queen cells are always um, vertical. They always, you know, they're always uh, hanging off almost like a little peanut hanging onto the surface. Whereas the rest of the brood will always be horizontal and in, inside the cell. Um, so in this case, it looks like they were, something was wrong with that queen and they were replacing her. And uh, the other side of that coin is um, swarm cells. Swarm cells are usually on the bottoms or the edges of, of frames. And there will be a lot of them because it's like a planned thing. And they, they usually look uh, more refined, kind of like the one on the bottom here. Usually all of them will be like that. Um, yeah. Do you want me to do another section or... I think we're at two hours now. So okay. I think, um, and you've covered a lot of information. So let's just go to the chat, answer questions, and then we will call it a day. I think you are planning on doing uh, another session yep, next, next week time. to continue. So we'll cover the questions now, but um, if you think of any other questions that come to you after the conclusion, of this meeting, feel free to note them and you can ask them in the next session or send an email. Um, so, so yeah, okay. So the other questions that came through was, what do you use to treat mites and how do you use it? So I assume that you're gonna be covering mites. Yeah, that's a, I have a very long section on Varroa. Um... I will say that what we what we use uh, almost exclusively is um, uh, ox oxalic acid and formic acid because those are the two organic um, uh, compounds that you can use to treat them, um, and they're very effective, um, especially the formic acid. But I do have a whole section on the next one on how to count 
So like that that information will be covered in the next session. Yeah. And then there was another question, again, coming back to placement of the hive. If the bees are sensitive to wind, do they need to be protected from wind? Yeah, windbreak. Um, I've seen hives that have blown, not mine, but I've seen people post about hives that have blown over. Um, one thing you could do that a lot of people do is um, ratchet straps. They'll actually ratchet strap the um, the whole hive together to a stand and it just helps keep it together. What I do, I don't have that bad of wind because we have a, a fence. So I put a heavy stone on top and um, and it's so full of honey and, and everything that it's pretty heavy anyway. Um, but yeah, you can use a ratchet strap if you're concerned about wind. Or just a heavy stone. Or a heavy stone, yeah. Even easier, yeah. Um, and do you recommend a source for supplies? I I use Better Bee a lot. Um, anything I can't get from my local guy, um, I pretty much get from Better Bee. I've gotten a couple. I got my extractor from Miller Beekeeping Supply, but most most everything else. What I like about Better Bee, again, they don't pay me. <laughs> they should though. Um, what I like about Better Bee is that almost all of their products come with like a, a manual of like how to use it and like different ways you could use it. And there's like a step-by-step -step and it's very clear. So I think that's what I like about them. And also their prices are pretty, pretty good. So. All right. Are there any last questions before we close up this call? All right, so I think we, Tyler is planning on doing another call next week at the same time next Sunday. So um, again, yeah, appreciate really. everyone who's held out to the very end here. I think we will be figuring out how to get this video. Again, we're recording this. We'll get this video to you guys. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you.